What if I were to tell you that there is a saint out there that if you had them involved in your spiritual life, it would completely transform your purgatory experience. In fact, he is the greatest Catholic male saint out there, and we are completely underusing him in every way, especially when it comes to purgatory. In fact, I had the privilege of interviewing a great devotee of St. Joseph who wrote the book, The Book of Joseph, a book that covers the entire life of St. Joseph from beginning to end. And both of us, when we researched St. Joseph and purgatory, what we found is hardly anything. And that needs to change right now because when we studied the small things that we did find, this is what we saw. He can affect your holiness now so that you have less time in purgatory. He can greatly help you to help the souls in purgatory and in your judgment, he can have a significant impact in your judgment and a reduction in your sentence for purgatory and in those that are already there. We will give several examples in the following interview. Now, this was originally a full hour interview that I condensed to make it a lot shorter. The longer version I will put out later. I will put a link down below to that book. And if you would like to support this channel in any way, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee. Now on to the interview. It's hard to find anything in actual church documents that connect Joseph to purgatory. Yes, his holy death and patron of the dying. Um, but I, ha I had a hard time finding anything that had the word purgatory in it. But one thing I found out, so this actually goes to um, artistic depictions of him. So after the Council of Trent in the 1500s, um, the church had rules as to how certain saints were to be depicted and how they were not to be depicted. And St. Joseph in particular was not or was to be depicted as lower class in dress, uh, older than the Virgin Mary, but not deformed or decrepit, uh, well kempt, but not overly attractive or handsome. And he cannot be smiling and he cannot have curly hair, etc. Things like that. That seems superficial. But when devotion to St. Joseph was brought to the New World, uh, to New Spain, Mexico, um, his image kind of went underwent a transformation. He was now depicted as being the same age as the Virgin Mary, uh, youthful, strong, dignified, and sometimes even smiling, and sometimes with rosy cheeks. And artists began depicting him in ways that were previously only reserved for the Blessed Virgin, such as interceding for the souls of purgatory. So traditionally, uh, in such depictions, you have the Virgin of Carmel, uh, seated in the center of the image, holding our Lord Jesus. And they're both holding scapulars uh, with the souls of purgatory beneath them. Now, what started happening in the new world was they, the artists are placing St. Joseph beside them um, and his posture would be indi in indicative of interceding for those souls and bringing their petitions to our Lord and our lady. Um, after these depictions became common, uh, Europe started adopting them. So Europe was learning from the New World. And eventually, some artists started putting St. Joseph in the center, holding Jesus with the souls of purgatory below. Um, I mean, that was, I don't want to say revolutionary, but it was the first type of real direct connection that showed St. Joseph caring for these souls. And uh, we we kind of owe the, the artists back then for bringing him into that role, because I'm sure he always interceded but now people are able to visualize it and actually concretely connect it and so um one of the venerables that i came across which uh, i didn't know about before is venerable sister consolata Betrone, and uh, she lived from 1903 to 1946 and she was an italian mystic uh, belonging to the poor clare nuns in turin italy and she was known for her intense promotion of the rosary along with this famous aspiration, aspiration, uh, Jesus, Mary, I love you, save souls. A lot of us have heard that before. Um, and allegedly it was given to her by Christ as a form of reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus and for the souls of purgatory. Um, and she, she only became a venerable uh, as early as 2019, so quite recently. Um, so if I could read from her diary, um, I could read about a connect, her connection to St. Joseph and Purgatory. Please do. Uh, this is, yeah, um, this is dated March 20th, 1935. And this is what she's writing. Uh, Franca wrote me a letter 
in which she announced my father's illness and his anguish. On the morning of April 17th at communion, I offered my dad to Jesus so that if it was his will, he would take him peacefully before the end of the year. That same day he died, but the prioress did not tell me the news until later that day. I wondered why our Lord hadn't informed me of my father's death, so I asked him, Jesus, where is my dad? He is in purgatory, Consolata. Consolata, free him, I beg you. Jesus said, I will release him Saturday morning. Consolata asked, not until Saturday? Sorry, Saturday morning. Um, on the afternoon of Holy Thursday, I heard my father's anguished voice telling me, Consolata, I'm in so much pain. And Jesus insisted to me, no, no, I cannot free him until Saturday. Feeling distraught, I asked for St. Joseph to help, and he appeared to me with the Virgin, saying, Consolata, what is going on with you? You are sad. Consolata replied, St. Joseph, my father is in purgatory, and Jesus does not want to release him until Saturday morning. Joseph replied, Do not worry. He will release your father tomorrow, Good Friday. Consolata said, But Jesus does not want it. I begged him, and he still he refused me. Joseph replied, Do not worry, my child, for even in heaven I am in charge of Jesus as his father, and tomorrow I will get him to free your father. On Good Friday, during the liturgical function, my father appeared to me, having just left purgatory. I will never forget the vision of my father. His face had shown that he had suffered greatly, but it had also a profound peace. He spoke to me in dialect and explained that he was going to heaven and that there he would pray for me and for all our family. So um, that's a beautiful example of his paternal intercession. Uh, and then on November 9th of that same year, 1935, uh, St. Joseph, to whom Consolata had chosen to be her father in place of her deceased parent, told her, I will help you in your mission and assist you the rest of your days. I am the protector of the dying and the terror of demons. In the last moments of your life, I will be at your side spiritually and sensitively. Does this make you happy? And uh, the last entry I'll read uh, from November 26, 1938, Jesus said to her, I give you, St. Joseph, to be your protector the rest of your life, to help you and prepare you for a holy death. So when I stumbled upon this uh, mystic, I was blown away because that was the first uh, apparition of St. Joseph talking about purgatory that I've ever been able to find. So I'm going to have to uh, update my book and add that in because I think it's, it's wonderful. And I think it's really profound, the thing that he says because it makes me think about the relationship that he has with Jesus and even how that's respected. And, and people can, can think about that. You know, I think uh, I think people have, have gained that understanding with the Blessed Mother because of so many different things. And, and for instance, like the scripture of, of, uh, of her role at, at the wedding at Cana. But I think this really gives this kind of amaz amazing insight of, let's say someone is having a difficulty because someone recently died and they're worried about their state of purgatory, they know, okay, I can go to Joseph using that phrase in this particular instance so that their deliverance can be even faster, especially if it's like a, a feast day of St. Joseph or, or, or even if they just have a strong devotion. So I think that would be wonderful for everyone to kind of weave that into their praying for the souls of purgatory. Absolutely. And it only makes sense. I mean, when you die, and he's a patron of the dying, when you die, you don't cease to exist. You continue on. And so I would think that he would still be your patron, even in purgatory. So, um, And I think that, uh, you know, our Lord refusing to release her father earlier, I think he probably did that so that she would turn to St. Joseph as a way to to display what his what St. Joseph can still do. So I think that was probably very cl a clever way of our Lord showing her, you know, my father will still help you and I still listen to him. I still respect him, you know? I think that's wonderful. Yeah, so I think we can kind of take this to think that there might be certain in instances or maybe many instances where a soul won't be delivered earlier unless unless we go to St. Joseph, unless we ask his intercession, 
which I think is is really amazing. And, and I think it speaks about... I think you said you had a, a blessed or a venerable that you wanted to talk about. There's this beautiful blessed, her name is Blessed Mary of Prover Providence. She was born Eugene, Eugenie Smet. She was born in France. Um, I, I don't know much about the time of history. I believe around the time of the French Revolution, where there was a lot of trouble. The French church, she was born in 1825, died in 1871. So if you think of kind of like a point of reference, the Miraculous Medal came about in 1830. And even in that apparition, there was a lot of things going on. And she, um, from a young child, uh, from, a, from a young age, had a strong love, especially for God's providence. And there'd be these instances where you, when you read about her life where she would almost trustingly ask God for anything and it would be granted. So she really had this devotion to God providing. And then she also had this incredible love for the souls in purgatory from early on. When she was discerning her vocation, she didn't really want to join another community, but was thinking first about uh, starting an association of praying for the souls in purgatory. When she would do that, she started one that grew a lot. It grew to have a lot of members. But then she felt like she wanted to do more. And she kept searching and searching to see, was there any religious community that was completely devoted to the souls in purgatory? And there weren't any. And so she decided to start one. So she started the first religious community completely dedicated to that. She had uh, the direction of, of some uh, Jesuit priests. So she adopted the rule of St. Ignatius. And then as you read in her life kind of later on, you see this, this uh, particular way that St. Joseph essentially kind of takes over that role of, of the one that provides. Um, and it, it's really what I found interesting was that it's sort of from a different angle um, because one of the things that helping the souls in purgatory is that it could be expensive um, and, and I know I always kind of bring in the idea that, it, that some of people cringe when you talk about God and money but it's just kind of a part of that reality and um, but in offering masses or in, um, or in having many masses pray for people but you see this way in which he provides for those means uh, there's sort of a couple stories that, that showcase that and I'll, um, but great as were the straits she was reduced to help always came in answer to her childlike appeals one day that the associates were in positive want they prayed earnestly to saint joseph and even venturing to specify the sum petitioned for 200 francs it was at mass they had made this request and the day passed without any sign that it had been heard Towards the evening, Eugenie went to pay a visit to their first benefactress and conversed with her some time. Just as she was rising to go away, that lady went and knelt down before an image of St. Joseph, which stood in a corner of her room, and prayed for an instant. Then coming back to her visitor, she said, My child, St. Joseph wishes me to give you 200 francs. And she, so she had this great trust in St. Joseph. And I think that's really powerful because now People, it, it, finances are difficult. Things are more expensive. Here where I'm staying with my grandmother, or my uh, grandmother-in-law and my, um, my wife's aunt, they talk about that, that things are so expensive. So for people to think about, okay, offering masses or offering Gregorian masses, they probably think that's very low on their list of importance. They have so many other things to, uh, to spend their money on. Well, you can go to Joseph to provide for you the means to provide for the souls in purgatory. And I think that's like a really unique way to help the souls in purgatory and to involve them in that process. That he both has an accessory role in their deliverance, but also in helping us help him. And that we don't need to worry. We really, really can trust him. And I think kind of tying to the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, that it's a time of need and a time of famine. Yeah. For some people, it kind of feels like that right now. And he, he really has this role that he can play. Again, I, I feel like he's been reserved, especially for our times. I mean, the first thousand years, we got to know who Christ was and made definitions and dogmatic pronunciations. And then the thousand years after that, uh, you know, we were learning about Our Lady and her role. And now this next thousand years, I think St. Joseph will be coming out more and people will be going to him more often. Uh, just like the people in Egypt went to their Joseph, you know, for sustenance in their time of need. Uh, mystic, if I could share, regarding St. Joseph yeah. in Purgatory. So this is just a short one. Um, 
It's a sister, Mary Martha Chambon, another French nun, uh, from 1841 to 1907. And she was a, a propagator of the Holy Wounds devotion. And she was allegedly received visits from Christ who told her that you must call St. Joseph your father, for I've given him the title and the goodness of a father. St. Joseph later began appearing to her, and once he said to her, I take account of all prayers that are addressed to me. If the soul who prays to me still has debts to pay at the end of his life to be carried out in purgatory, I shall ask for the sovereign judge to grant grace and leniency to that soul. Like you said, for for those, those of us who maybe can't afford to have masses said all the time for people, if we go to St. Joseph and ask for the means to have these masses offered, uh, like I, I've never thought of doing that. So I think it's wonderful that you mentioned this. Uh, so I'll, I'll start praying for that specific intention now too, that I can have uh, masses offered for certain people that I, I care for. Another thing that uh, that comes to mind is, is I had a chance to go to Rome a few years back. And when I went there, I visited a ton of churches, as many as I could possibly see. My favorite one, was probably the one dedicated to purgatory it, just because the painting in the middle is so beautiful i'll put the image up here but it's called uh the church of the, the sacred heart of suffrage and um, that's the name of it but the priest that found it is specifically wanted it to be dedicated to offering mass to the souls in purgatory and in the center the centerpiece right behind the altar right in in the center you'll see this image of jesus um, with his heart radiating grace and the blessed mother petitioning him on one side and St. Joseph on the other. And there it shows like essentially all of what we believe about purgatory. You see this priest offering masses, these angels uh, getting graces from the heart of Jesus and, and pouring it on the souls of purgatory. It's almost exactly the, the way that this one um, book described, I believe it's the, the visions of purgatory. It, it describes it exactly like that. And uh, and whenever I see that, I think that, that says everything that St. Joseph is right up there interceding. He, he has a most beautiful face. I, again, I'll put that image up for people to see. But I think that could, uh, that shows his kind of his humble power. And he's right beside the Blessed Mother interceding. And how about we we, we close the video in trusting uh, this whole video and, and all of what God wants to do to St. Joseph through this prayer. Um, this is actually by Cardinal Rollo, who was an Archbishop of Quebec, uh, Canada from 1926 to 1931. And he, he had a great love for him. So this is what he says before the prayer. He says, The power of St. Joseph, patron of the universal church, is surely exercised over the suffering church, as well as over the church militant, the lit which means purgatory. The litanies invoke him, calling him patron of the dying. The dying, whom he consoles at the moment of transition, can obviously immediately count on his paternal protection in purgatory and uh the prayer he's he composed he granted a 200 days indulgence uh for a soul in purgatory so the prayer goes like this great saint joseph who loved of jesus so tenderly and felt so keenly the pain of his absence during the time he spent in limbo go to the aid of the soul of here you name your loved one be his comforter and his intercessor before Jesus and Mary. May the sufferings of the pious faithful and the merits of the Savior be applied to him, so that freed from the bonds that hold him, he may fly to the bosom of God and enter into possession of eternal happiness. Amen. Thank you everyone for joining us. Please, I'll, I'll put links down below in the description so you can learn more about Joah and, and his ministry. Keep us in your prayers, and I will see you in the next one.